Uh, Ukan, you argue in your paper that um, Euromaidan critically disturbed the balance between the two main forces in Ukraine, uh, the balance between the Ukrainophile forces and the um, groups of interest in the, in the East, and you describe it as a Faustian bargain. So uh, could you tell us what was this bargain and how was it destroyed? Well, basically the bargain was um, that in the early 1990s, when you had sort of half of the country, which was more Russophile, the other half was more Ukrainophile, that basically the Ukrainophile side basically offered the, the Russophile East a share of the power and a stake in independent Ukraine and gave them a, you know, you know, a positions in the central government and were not excluded from power. And th this was the basic Faustian bargain because a lot of, as a result, you had enormous amounts of corruption in Ukraine. Um, but at the same time, East was given a stake. So I think that was the Faustian bargain. And basically what happened in, with the Maidan is you had the breakdown of that bargain and the breakdown of pro-Eastern forces in Ukraine, in, in, the, in the power structures. So what could be consi the consequence for Ukraine? Well, I think the consequences for Ukraine was that it provided an opening for Putin to come in and invade Ukraine. And I think that was the, con that you basically, you had a, a uh, breakdown in the power structure in eastern Ukraine, and which provided an opening for someone like Putin to come in. And I think that was important to realize about Euromaidan was that it only represented half the country. And I think there was an impression on the square that th this was somehow representing of, of all of Ukraine. This was, you know, this was representing society, when in fact, you know, all polls show consistently it represented about half. And I think that was the big misconception that I think led to the you know, profound alienation in Donbass. You have polls in the April of, um, showing that 70%, 70% in Donbass thought the government in Kiev was illegal. I mean, that's, you know, really helps civil war. We discussed a lot the question whether it was, it was a civil war or an invasion, uh, the situation in Donbass, and you argued that it was both. Uh, and also that uh, usually civil wars are a com were a combination of invasion, external invasion and internal factors. Uh, I guess now we're seeking for a comparison between Ukraine and another situation of civil war. What could, could be uh, the country or the, situ the historical situation to be compared with? Well, I don't know, yeah, there are many, but I think that most, the point is that most, we tend to think of them as an alternative. Most involve both invasion and civil war. And the reason why I think it's important to to say it's both because I think if you say it's invasion, it implies, you know, you think Germany invading France, that there's really no domestic component and, and, all, and the response has to be entirely military. So the extent that you see it as a domestic, you know, that it's responding to domestic events, the response cannot be s simply military. And I think that's why it's important to sort of recognize the domestic components to this crisis. Uh, you also say that, um, uh, Saying today in uh, in the Canadian academic community that Maidan did not did not represent the whole country was kind of controversial. Could you elaborate a little more about? That? Well, I think in, in the community I live in Toronto, I mean, I think there's very strong support for for Yero Maidan, but I think that it's um, because it's so polarized and because what Russia has, has done is so aggressive and belligerent and so horrible, it's very hard to sort of present um, the story in a nuanced manner because to the extent that you present any complexity, there's a, always a concern that that's sort of helping Putin, providing fodder, propaganda fodder. So I've been called you know, a useful idiot, to which my wife responds, she agrees that I'm an idiot, she doesn't think that I'm so useful. But uh, anyway. We are engaged in an information war right now, and I guess uh, in Ukraine also you, it's difficult n now to analyze the situation as a, uh, as a civil war. What is, from your point of view, um, the position that should have on this conflict and on the situation in Ukraine, the international community? I, mean, I think that the, what the international community needs to do is I think it needs to encourage the um, sort of not strictly military response. Um, and I think, I think one of the things I think is, is important to realize is that it's true that the, that the conflict was started by Russia and that Russia is primarily responsible. But the thing is that we have a lot less influence on, on Russia 
but we have a lot more influence on the Ukrainian government as the West. And I think, therefore, we can sort of are in a position to encourage a more political solution rather than a military solution, and we're certainly in a position to, to discourage sort of outright violations of international law, such as the use of cluster bombs and the like, that really you know, are purely punitive and do nothing to resolve the conflict. Thank you very much. Yeah.